The goal of today's session is to clarify common misconceptions about heat of compression desiccant dryers. This type of dryer accomplishes desiccant regeneration through the heat generated during compression. Our first speaker is uh, Hank, Van, Hank Van Ormer, and Mr. Van Ormer is the founder of Air Power USA, and he has over 50 years of experience in the compressed air and gas industry. Take it away, Hank. Uh, thank you. Uh, many of you were on there, I was open the list, were on our earlier uh, webinar on heated compression, but I'm still going to spend a little time on where we are as, as we get into to the clearing up the confusion. Uh, all, all compressed, all commercial uh, compressed air desiccant dryers basically dry the same way, uh, adsorbing the water vapor to the desiccant beads in the bed, which is usually activated alumina. The difference is how they regenerate uh, from heatless to all the way to different types of heated dryers. The heated dryers add heat to increase the difference in relative humidity based on the fact that hotter air holds more water vapor and you can regenerate the tower faster and by pulling off the, the water vapor faster. That's basically it. So the question is, they all operate similarly. The question with heated dryers is, where does the heat source come from? Now, the, base, so the basic operating principles, whether it's heated compression or not heated compression, are basically the same. Uh, the heated compression dryer is an established uh, process that's been out since the 60s, over 50 years. The basic operating principles are the same. For various reasons, there are many misconceptions about this technology that confuse the potential user with its regardless capabilities. Like all quality equipment, in order to select and apply the right dryer for the conditions, the appropriate personnel must understand the basic operation. So before looking into the, some of these misconceptions or myths, let's review some of the basic operating characteristics of, uh, of, the, of the heated compression dryer. Now, first question, where does, the, where does the heated compression come from? It comes from the basic inefficiency of compressed air. If for every eight horsepower of energy input, you get one horsepower worth of work out of the out of the compressed air. Seven horsepower of that energy that is not being used in the form of work comes off as heat. What does that amount to? Well, it amounts it amounts to uh, seventeen thousand eight hundred and twenty-two BTUs per hour for one horsepower worth of compressed air work. So this this heat when it was is generated in the compressor, if you don't use it, it, you cool it away, it goes away. If you use it, there's no additional cost, it's, and it basically it's free. In other words, you've already paid the cost when you compress the air, so it's basically free. And if you have an oil-free hot air supply, then some of all of this heat can be used to dry the air. If it's dependent on what your conditions are and what your needs are. Are there any limitations? Yeah. You need hot, oil free, compressed air. Uh, early in the development of the use of this of this particular product or technology, oil free compressors were kind of avoided. They were expensive, they were less efficient uh, than the lubricated version of the same. So it, it, many people didn't bother with I, I don't I don't want to understand the technology because I'm not going to use it because I have lubricated machines. Over the last several decades, and particularly now, the oil-free market compressor is the oil non-lubricated compressor market is expanding faster than any other part of it. More and more demand for that. With that, the the Heat HOC or the heated compression dryer is now becoming a bigger item. 
And for most commercial air systems, it's a it's a viable choice for what, as long as you have oil-free compressed air available. It is there is nothing in the dryer technology with lower operating cost than an HOC dryer under whatever the conditions are, and energy-wise. Uh, we can go back to what I said earlier in the, on the first slide. The drying part of the process, whether it's heatless, floor purge, external heat, or heat of compression, it doesn't matter. They all have the same. The, the, the water vapor in the compressed air comes into the tower and is absorbed to the surface of the beads. Doesn't matter. Now, if it's one one thing we did say in the past, if you weren't, if, if is you you can't be over 130 degrees, or it probably won't won't do any work. It won't work. Okay. Now, where they differ is how we regenerate. You regenerate the tower, the same tower you you put the moisture in. You regenerate that tower by creating a difference in relative humidity between the bead and the air that's going past it, which we call a purge air. So how do I, do? if I use a heatless dryer, I use 15, 20% of the air because it's coming in cool, but it's very dry, but you're losing a lot of dry air. To, to, to offset that, if I can add some heat to that purge air, then I've increased my my ability to hold water, more water vapor, thus expanding the, the differential in the re relative humidity between the, the beads and the, and the air, and I can remove the moisture faster. But this, in most dryers, this is done with some sort of heat, whether it's a electric heater, a steam heater, uh, it can be a blower purge, different heater. They all have a different style in this, but in heated compression, this is the only one that we don't have to add any heat other than what's coming from the compressor with some limitations. So all the other dryers, heated, heated dryers, take in, all the other dryers take in after cooled air at around 100 degrees the, after it's gone through the after cooler. In the heated compression dryer, the inlet air going to the drying tower on the left is, is taken before the after cooler and it's probably going to be 200 degrees or more that's that's the normal what we're looking for so that that air so we dry the air it goes through the after cooler at the after cooler you remove the moisture that's in the air and then it goes to the drying tower and you dry it just like you would have dried it in any other dryer the only difference is we're Instead of taking after cooled air, we're taking the hot air and letting that create the relative humidity difference. So, with, the, with these thoughts in mind, kind of keep these things in mind. This is how they work. It's pretty simple. They all work the same, more or less, except what I said. I got to have after cooled air going to every other dryer and the heated compression dryer. I need hot, oil-free air going to the dryer. Now, this starts. This is where some of the misconceptions start. So let's take a look at them. Misconception one: There must be a 350-degree discharge temperature from the compressor for the dryer to work. There are many applications over the last 50 years drying effectively at at or near 200 degree Fahrenheit discharge temperature. Regeneration air needs a significant difference in relative humidity to pick up the moisture off the bed. It doesn't have to be 350. If you run, do a little thought, put a little math on there, and I, we had this uh, in a, earlier. If I've got the inlet air coming in and it's at 200 degrees, I probably got about a 9% relative humidity versus 100, and at 350, I got 3.2% relative humidity. 
Now, that's based on an average probably coming out of a multi-stage compressor, about 35 grains per cubic foot of moisture in, in, the, in the discharge air. So when you raise the temperature, that, that allows it to hold more air and that, that becomes the relative humidity. So with a, with a continuous and stable low pressure dew point, it's required that dryer might have to be equipped with such options as auxiliary heat source, dry air cooling, et cetera. Uh, when well controlled, it will only be it will only run these auxiliary uh, applications if it when needed. It, but it does not require 350. It, it obviously you have got very big a very big change either way, very big differential. The compressor must run 100% of the time. Uh, it will operate on varying loads, and we'll see that in a little later, but the air compressor must be loaded high enough to deliver a 200 degree temperature to the dryer. If not, then the same options I just talked about, uh, auxiliary heat, uh, dry air cooling can be added to the dryer, which will take, will take care of it no matter what the conditions. So basically, it's kind of a spin-off from number one. If the air compressor is down, the dryer's down. Well, <clears throat> many HOC dryers, if you say, well, it's dedicated one compressor, one dryer, which is not always the case either. But many manufacturers offer an optional ability to switch the heatless dryers until a repair is made, and then you can switch it back to HOC. So if that's if that's a critical point, that's how you handle that point. It's it's not a it's not something that's a, you're fixed in. This one is one that is really has been around, and I, you hear this all the time when we talk about applying these these dryers. You have to run one compressor to one dryer. This is not accurate. When the system's well designed, the the, the people that I think what drives this misconception is that the <clears throat> the uh, thought that well I can't I got to keep it loaded, and we're going to see that's not really the case. Now, here's a screenshot from a automotive plant. I've got four compressors running and three dryers. My pressure dew points are minus 57, minus 63, and minus 56. Number three compressor is on, is the only one that's on, AC3. One, two, and four are off. So we're running, we're basically running these dryers, splitting the load evenly, at about a 20% flow rate. It doesn't have to be 100% flow rate. It just has to be, well, let's take a look at the next slide, which is a schematic of what this system is. The inlet air to that dryer, to those dryers, is 234. Average pressure dew point coming out, minus 57 at a 20% load. There is, now, if it got down lower than that and the pressure and the temperature and the temperature got lower, then you might have to add auxiliary heat. But at this point, we don't need it. Uh, HL heated compression dryers have very high pressure drop. That's not quite, that's a, that, that's a, 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 something that people observe because the after cooler loss and separator loss in the, in the is usually in the compressor where it's built into the compressor and after that it goes you know goes to the system here we're going from the compressor to the dryer through the after cooler in the process the, the net number <clears throat> the net loss should be the same uh, on whatever type of dryer we got other than, other than design How this one gets out, I don't know. HOC dryers lose a lot of air. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
if you have a full flow model with no trim heater and no compressed no compressed air is lost, as shown in the dryer gram we used a while back there a little bit. Other dryers are going to use anywhere from 5 to 15 percent of dry air with purge sweep. There's no lost air. The, the air that is used to pick up the moisture, it goes through the aftercooler and then it goes to the system and it's dry and nothing is blown off. If you are going to put a full featured <clears throat> heated compression dryer in, you may have a stripping and cooling cycle to optimize the performance if we're not holding a dew point and we need a little more heat or we're not getting enough load or whatever the reasons are. Stripping is usually only 90 minutes with a typical air loss of 2% during that 90 minutes. Go ahead. If the, if the, if the air compressor discharge temperature is too low, you have to heat all of the inlet air. No, now that the other dryers we're talking about heat all of the inlet air or all of the blower purge air, whatever it is. In the, in the case of a heated compression dryer, we're running a 90 minute cycle at 2% versus a 5 to 15% demand over a three hour cycle, potentially, depending on the controls. So it's going to be less no matter how you look at it. Now, HOC dryer cannot deliver a low pressure dew point. This is this is uh, one that is, causes a lot of people confusion. The misconception has been promoted by some otherwise knowledgeable people, people stating HOC dryers with multi-stage air compressors cannot provide better than a minus 20 degree Fahrenheit PDP below 180 PSIG. Much of the support for this inaccurate conclusion comes from a study prepared using molecular sieve des desiccant in the drying bed. The calculations used in the are, use the appropriate isotherms for the molecular sieve and 125 degree desiccant bed operating temperature. The math is correct for that set of conditions. The premise and the conclusions are incorrect and inaccurate. What's, what is molecular sieve? Molecular sieve is a synthesized, excuse me, synthesized product designed for specific uses and end, often used in gas separation field. Industrially, it is, is sometimes used as a final drying agent at the tower exit, taking advantage <clears throat> of its ability to dry effectively with a low relative humidity differential. The recommended regeneration temperature usually is from 300 degrees to 500 degrees, not 125 degrees. The, molecular, the conclusion reached by the state is not relevant because molecular sieve is not the bed desiccant used in HOC dryers. Heated, most heated compression desiccant dryers use a desiccant selection called activated alumina which is what most of the basic dryers use. Now, here's a, here's, a, here's a dryer running another screenshot showing, there go. Okay. here's another screenshot showing <clears throat> a setting of a dryer. The setting point is minus 20. The actual dew point is minus 148. It it, it, uh, it it does work. It's you know none of this is mystical. Uh, this is just standard dryer technology. So it shouldn't be confusing. We're just supplying a heat from a different source and, we're not, and controlled. Now one of the <clears throat> final thought on on heated compression dryers is that it, it bridges the gap all the way from the refrigerated dryers deliver a plus 40, let's say, for nominal plus 40 degree dew point. The desiccant dryer can deliver down to minus 100, but let's say normally the minus 40 dew point. 
the heated compression dryer, all dryers could bridge the gap, but it really bridges the gap because if you get high enough up, it, you run in a dryer with no energy use whatsoever. <clears throat> so what pressure dew point do you need? Often, heated compression dryers are selected instead of refrigerated dryers for several reasons. One is, if I can get to a plus 20 or even a plus 10 degree Fahrenheit pressure dew point, I've removed more than twice the amount of moisture removal as a well-performing refrigerated dryer. No Freon, low cycling cost, and no energy cost. Because a, a, a heated compression dryer is, will give you, under most conditions, anywhere from a, <clears throat> a plus 20 to a plus 10. Let's go to the next. Let's, let's look at the energy cost of a 4,000 CFM refrigerated direct expansion dryer compared to a heated compression dryer, no auxiliary heat, delivering a plus 10 to a plus 20. And what that this is this is a pretty significant number if you're looking at operating cost. It's if a 4,000 CFM set. $9,679 for the heated, for the refrigerated dryer. And call it $44 for the desiccant for the uh, heated compression dryer. $9,635 a year savings in energy costs. With twice or more, double or more the energy, the moisture removal. These are just things to think, and I, I hope it's of interest to you, and the next uh, Chuck will be on, for Henderson will be on <clears throat> to go over some of the opportunities and ways of doing, making sure it works. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Van Ormer. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, you can submit any questions that you have for our presenters at any time. So if you have some questions, please just submit them now or uh, whenever, you, whenever you have them. Okay, our next speaker is Chuck Henderson. Mr. Henderson is the Vice President of Henderson Engineering Company. And uh, take it away, Chuck. Thank you, Claire. Appreciate it. Um, we're going to talk about installation guidelines for heat of compression. And thank you, Hank. I appreciate everything you did. That was awesome. And I'd like to say hi to people um, that are logging in from all over the world. We have heat of compression dryers installed in every corner of the globe. And this is an installation of heat of compression dryers in Brazil. There's 19 dryers. Um, 16 of them are 10,000 CFM each. This is one of the largest installations of any kind of dryer anywhere in the world that I'm aware of. But with heat of compression, you've got all these dryers operating at virtually a zero energy consumption, zero operating cost. Now, when heat of compression was first developed back in the 60s, most dryer companies didn't make it. There's very few dryer companies that built in because if you don't make something, you're not going to promote it. So if you don't make this type of dryer, you're going to tell your salesman, sell against it, tell your customers that it doesn't work. And eventually over time when uh, customers kept saying, hey, you know, I bought a heated compression dryer and it really does work, many dryer companies then started to make their own and ran into problems. If you don't use the right components, then the dryer doesn't work. So a couple of limitations with heat of compression. First off, the compressor has to be oil free. Right? We cannot use heat of compression dryers with lubricated compressors. And the dryer has to be located relatively close to the compressor. We can't have the compressor in building A and the dryer in building Z. They don't have to touch, but obviously you want to minimize piping and heat loss between the compressor and the dryer because we're utilizing the heat of compression to regenerate, you don't want to lose any. Now with any mechanical equipment, there's two basic considerations that determine whether it works or not. Right? First is your basic design. If you have a good design, it should work. 
Second is your Jurassic components. If you use the right components, everything should work. But if you have a bad design and good components, you have a problem. If you have the right design and the wrong components, you have a problem. So for your basic design with heat compression, it's helpful if regeneration is full flow. If you're using all of the air from the compressor, then when the compressor isn't fully loaded, you're still getting high temperature air to regenerate. If you split flow and only use 25% of the heat of compression to regenerate and the compressor is lightly loaded, you just don't get good temperature. So the first basic design for heat of compression, regeneration really should be full flow. Now, if you're cooling, if you cool with wet air, you're going to preload the desiccant and that raises your dew point. So anytime you're cooling the desiccant bed in the regenerating tower, you want to cool with dry air. If you need supplemental heat, you put a heater at the inlet of the dryer, well, now you're adding pressure drop all the time, and it's a large heater, so you're consuming a significant amount of energy. And if you're using multiple after coolers, well, that's a lot more gallons per minute of cooling water, um, more separators, drain trap potential for failure. So ideally, just have one after cooler, one heat exchanger mounted on the dryer. For your choice of components, well, your valves have to leak, um, be bubble tight, um, no leakage. When some dryer manufacturers decided to get into heat compression, they used their standard choice of valves. And if a valve leaks on a heatless dryer, it's not the end of the world. In fact, the dryer works a little better. When air leaks across a valve on a heatless, you're actually purging more, you get better dew points. With heat compression, if a valve leaks, the dryer doesn't work, basically. So all of the valves have to be high performance, bubble tight, zero leaks. Anybody that makes heat of compression dryers with multi-part valves, you're going to have problems. A three-way or a four-way valve inherently has to leak and should never be used in heat of compression dryers. Some of the components that absolutely have to work are um, the little things, like a drain trap. If the drain trap fails, the dryer fails. It's the same kind of a concept on a refrigerant dryer. If you have a refrigerant dryer and there's no water coming out of the drain trap, well, where is it? It's downstream. Same thing with heat of compression. The bulk of the water is removed in the after-pull or separator drain traps. So if the trap fails, the dryer fails. Other components that have to work, separators. The separator has to be efficient at zero to 100% flow. Some separator designs are flow dependent. Uh, we designed a coalescing separator, the same kind of performance as a coalescing filter, but you're not replacing filter elements every few months. The separator can be cleaned, uh, back flushed, uh, if you build a pressure drop, but generally the pressure drop is minimal and it's going to operate for years without problems. There's several factors that determine the correct size of a heater compression dryer. It's basically the same factors that determine the size of any regenerative dryer. The first is your regeneration temperature, right? What's the minimum discharge temperature from the compressor? What's your maximum flow rate? How much air are you drying? What's your maximum cooling water temperature? Now, typically we talk about cooling water for the after cooler. Uh, you can use air-cooled heat exchangers. The only consideration if you have an air-cooled heat exchanger and you're in a very uh, hot environment, then you want to use a low-approach heat exchanger. Even when we do water-cooled, our standard design is a 10-degree approach. So let's say you have 85-degree cooling water, 10-degree approach, means that you have 95-degree drying temperature. The drying temperature determines your water load. Okay, that's the most important consideration in sizing the dryer. How much water do you have to remove? So the colder we can get it, the better. If customers need extremely low dew point, sometimes we look at trim heat exchangers using chilled water. Right? Then the last design consideration is your minimum inlet pressure. Now this is going to be true for any dryer. When we talk about pressure, we look at our maximum pressure for pressure vessel design and component design, but the dryer is always designed on the minimum inlet pressure. One of the common mistakes 
uh, some salesmen make or their customers make is say, okay, I have a 125 pound air compressor. Okay, that's great. That means the compressor is capable of delivering 125 pounds, but what's it actually operating at? Well, it's probably 80 or 90. Okay, so we have to design the dryer based on the 80 or 90, not the 125. I'm going to go back to the slide at General Motors because when you have multiple compressors and multiple dryers, you can manifold the compressors and the dryers together. The consideration is making sure that you have equal flow distribution across the dryers. You don't want to have the flow of four compressors going into dryer one and nothing going into dryers two or three. So you put throttling valves, basically a, a butterfly valve, in front of the dryers that you can open or close and measure pressure drop and flow across the dryer to make sure that you have equal flow across all dryers. Air will take the path of least resistance. So if you have a shorter run of pipe from the compressor manifold to dryer A, well, more air is going to go into dryer A. So you always want to make sure that the flow is equally balanced. Can we talk about um, performance? Again, you know, Hank talked about this particular installation here. You see we have 234 degree regeneration temperature. That's the air temperature from the compressors going into the dryer. And we're delivering a minus 57 degree Fahrenheit pressure dew point. Now, you can get different dew points out of regenerative dryers. Typically, people talk about minus 40 as the standard dew point from a regenerative dryer. Well, that's basically what the desiccant gives you. Most regenerative dryers use activated alumina. Some might use silica gel. That's kind of rare. The 99% of regenerative dryers use alumina. Alumina gets you minus 40 or better if you regenerate it correctly. So here we see a customer that is getting better than minus 60. And over time, as the desk can become saturated, the dew point rises. This customer set the dew point control system to switch towers at minus 40. So when we hit minus 40, we switch towers and the dew point immediately drops. There's no spike. It doesn't go above minus 40. It doesn't go above your set point. This dryer operates on a four hour um, regeneration time cycle, an eight hour time cycle, four hours drying, four hours of regenerating. So here's our normal four hour time. And then we go into standby where we simply dry the air until the dew point rises to the set point. It gets up to minus 40 and we switch towers again. Now there are heater compression dryer designs that will have dew point spikes at tower shift. You could spike up to essentially saturation for a minute or two and then the dew point drops. Generally, for most applications, this isn't a big deal because you're going to have uh, a receiver or a of pipe so that the air has a chance to blend and homogenize so that the average dew point downstream is still quite low. But if uh, dew point spikes are, a, are considered to be a problem, there are heater compression designs that eliminate spikes and are able to deliver minus 40 or better points on a year-round basis. Now I go back to the slide of the operating costs. Heat compression became popular because of energy consumption, energy savings. Now this is 4,000 CFM comparison. 4,000 CFM at 100 PSI and 100 degrees Fahrenheit operating around the clock with electricity based at 5 cents a kilowatt. Now my company makes all of these different types of regenerative dryers. And I feel like it's my job to help present our customers with options, with choices. If you want a 4,000 CFM heatless dryer, God bless you, I'm happy to make it. You can get minus 40 or minus 100 dew points. But that heatless dryer at 5 cents a kilowatt is going to cost you $83,000 a year to operate. We make externally heated dryers, right? the same dew point, minus 40. That dryer is going to cost you $46,000 a year to operate. We make blower per dryers, again, minus 40 dew points, $41,000 or $33,000. Um, the higher is if you have a purge sweep to cool. 
No, heat of compression. If you want year on minus 40, we can do that. There's going to be a small amount of purge year. The cost of that purge is going to be roughly $5,000 a year. So your comparison for the same equivalent performance is 83,000, 46,000, 41, 32,000, or 5,000 to get the same dew point. Now, if you can live with a little higher dew point, a zero to minus 40, you can get a heat of compression dryer with no heaters, no purge, essentially the operating cost of a light bulb, and that's the $43 a year, right? which is dramatically better than even a refrigerator dryer. Even the heat of compression that got minus 40 is half the price to operate of a refrigerator dryer. Now, heat of compression costs about the same to buy as a blower purge. Heatless is cheaper to buy, but obviously dramatically more expensive to operate. So heat compression is very popular because, well, there's virtually no operating cost. It's inherently more reliable than other dryers. If we look at a blower purge dryer, when you have a heater and a blower, those components can fail. If you look at a heatless dryer, you're purging 15% of your air and you're switching towers every 15 minutes, excuse me, every five minutes. Heat of compression, you're typically switching towers every four hours. And heat of compression can give you guaranteed performance. If you need a specific dew point, no problem. Heat of compression dryers are capable of giving you the dew point that you require. We can actually get extremely low dew points. We have heat of compression dryers delivering dew points below minus 100. And this kind of performance is required typically by process industries. If you're just looking for plant air, shop air, instrument quality air, minus 40 is fine, or even higher. In the U.S., the Instrument Society of America says that instrument quality air shall be 10 degrees C or 18 degrees Fahrenheit below ambient. So when it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit outside, you don't need minus 40. When it's minus 20 outside, you do need minus 40. And my last slide here is a picture of my welding crew. This is the shell of one pressure vessel. We built a couple of 30,000 CFM heat of compression dryers that made their way to Australia. And just about everybody that welds for me fits inside of one shell. So we make lots of big dryers. I thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about heat of compression dryers. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Henderson. Uh, now we will transition to the Q&A section of the webinar. We have roughly 10 minutes, so we will try to be as efficient as possible in answering your questions. If you would like additional details on a particular topic, please submit the request in the questions window and we can reach out following the webinar. Uh, we did have a question come in asking for a copy of the presentation. After the webinar, again, everyone will be emailed a link to the presentation. Okay, so uh, going to our first question, this comes from a automotive manufacturer, and this is for Chuck. And the question is, when using cool, the cool sweep option, is the flow required 2% of dryer capacity or demand? Is 2% average demand or max purge? 2% is the instantaneous demand at the time. So the dryer that has the purge um, the purge sweep is 2% for 90 minutes out of a four hour cycle. So for four hours, only 90 minutes are you purging and it's 2% at that time. And there is a uh, throttling valve that allows you to adjust that flow rate. So you can increase it or decrease it as necessary. Okay. This next question is for Mr. Van Ormer, and the question comes from an engineering firm located in New York. The question is, can heat of compression desiccant dryers be used for delivering air at even higher dew points, such as 50 degrees Fahrenheit? Oh, 15 degree Fahrenheit? Yes. 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 In fact, that's, that's one of the nice parts about it. The higher the dew point, then better, I mean, it's, 
that's what I said, it bridges the difference between the plus 40 of the refrigerated all down to whatever you want. So at plus 15, that's a, basically a, a energy-free dew point that you're going to be able to run when you set it up right. You, you're going to do the $44 a year. Okay. This next question uh, goes to Mr. Henderson, and it comes from a com air compressor distributor. The question is, for a negative 20 degree Celsius pressure dew point, what type of desiccant should be used? Activated aluminum. Okay. Uh, you, you could use silica gel or sorbi, but uh, the standard desiccant that everybody uses in regenerative dryers is simply activated aluminum. Okay. This next question is for Mr. Van Ormer. The question is, do all heat of compression dryers have the ability to switch to heatless if required? Do all heat of compression dryers have the ability to switch to heatless? No, uh, that's, actually, yeah, that's, a, that's an option that's available from the manufacturer. So you just have to check on it. If you're looking at them, whoever you're talking to, and see if they have it. Uh, I, I I know that uh, Henderson has it. Henderson Engineering has it in theirs, and it's doable on any dryer if you if you've designed it. Okay. This next question is for uh, Mr. Henderson. The question is: Can heat of compression dryers deliver negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit dew points? Absolutely. Um, we need to look at the design conditions and depending on your regeneration temperature from the compressor we may need to add supplemental heat we'll, um, have a trim heater on our stripping line uh, we may need to add a trim heat exchanger and use chilled water but we have a variety of heat of compression dryers delivering better than minus 100 all over the world okay this next question is for mr. van Ormer. It comes from a utility. The question is, are there uh, any minimum pressure requirements uh, for heat of compression dryers to work? Well, I think that's part of the sizing thing that would go back to it that Chuck talked about. As the pressure goes down, then your moisture load goes up. So at some point, I, I might defer this to Chuck to comment on it too, but at some point it may it, it, you the dryer may have to get so big that it becomes uneconomical. And I would like like Chuck to comment on that a little more. We actually do a lot of dryers at 40 PSIG for glass plants. That's an ideal application for heat of compression. So when you're talking about low pressure, when you have uh, like a booster blower or something at five pounds, 10 pounds, that's different technology. That's not a twin tower dryer. All of the components that we and typical dryer manufacturers use are 150 PSI components. So if you're looking at um, dampers and louvers and duct work, that's different. Uh, but typically, uh, we've got machines at 20 pounds. That's not a, a big deal. Now, at lower pressure, the dryer becomes bigger just because you can't afford much pressure drop. But um, low pressure is not a, a problem. Okay. This next question is for Mr. Henderson, and the question is uh, coming from an engineering firm in New York, and they would like to know uh, if you could speak about any of the maintenance requirements and tips for the heat of compression dryers. Yeah, maintenance is basically the same for heat of compression as all regenerative dryers. The desiccant needs to be replaced periodically. Now, since you're using oil-free air, typically we're looking at seven to 10 years for desiccant life. Uh, now you replace after filter cartridges once a year. That's gonna be true for any dryer. Now actually one of the hidden benefits with heat of compression is that you don't have a coalescing pre-filter. Even if you have an oil-free compressor and you buy a heatless, a heated, a blower purge dryer, you're going to have a coalescing pre-filter ahead of the dryer just to protect the dryer from liquid water carryover from the aftercooler, right? Even if there's no oil, you still have a pre-filter. And that pre-filter builds a pressure drop 
and you have to change those cartridges typically six to nine months. So a, a hidden benefit of heat of compression is you eliminate the need for a coalescing pre-filter, so you don't need to buy it. You don't have the pressure loss of the air going through the elements, so you don't have to change elements. Uh, switching valves, um, typically the valves are going to last you at least five years. In fact, we guarantee performance of all switching valves for five years. Um, solenoid valves, typically several years. There's really very little maintenance required for heat of compression or any conventional regenerator dryer for that matter. Okay. This next question comes from a uh, pharmaceutical company in Illinois, and it's for Mr. Van Ormer. And the question is, what is the lowest amount of CFM the system can be used for for a uh, heat of compression dryer to, to work and be efficient? Well, I, I'm going to defer that one to Chuck, too, because but obviously, theoretically, there would be no limit, but there is a practical limit. So let me, let me defer that to the guy that makes them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we make heat of compression dryers as small as 100 CFM. Now, the interesting thing you know, with the two designs, the, the simple design, the $43 a year design, it's $43 a year whether you're drying 100 CFM, 1,000, or 10,000, because the only operating cost of the dryer is the electrical controls, the PLC. When you're looking at larger um, flow rates, it's tremendously economical for heat compression. Um, we do make small ones, but we make more dryers above 1,000 CFM than we do below 1,000 CFM. Now, also for a pharmaceutical, you're probably looking at minus 40. And so there, um, we would be looking at the um, HC design, which is going to get you minus 40 year round that's going to have the um, purge sweep to get you the low dew points. Um, typically, pharmaceuticals are looking for flat line dew points. Okay. This next question comes from a compressor distributor located in Brazil. And they would like to know, uh, this question will be for Mr. Van Ormer. They would like to know if the stripping purge is just to guarantee the pressure dew point constantly. Or consistency. The, the, the strip, but the heating heating of the stripping air is would come on if you're trying to hold a dew point and the conditions had moved to the point that it needed assistance. In other words, if you you're not getting the numbers you need, yes, that's what it's for. It comes on and heats until it's not required anymore. Uh, that heat at the full load would be two percent for for 90, 90 minutes out of a three, four hour cycle. And, and if I could add, stripping can be done with or without supplemental heat. You can add a trim heater if you need a specific dew point. Simply using uh, the purge sweep, 2% for 90 minutes, gives you dew points that are roughly 30 degrees Fahrenheit lower than if you don't use the purge sweep. So if the, the inexpensive heat of compression got you a zero dew point, Simply by using that small amount of purge air, you go from zero to minus 30. If you need better, then we'll look at other options to get better. Okay. All right, that takes us to the uh, end of the allotted time. All questions will be followed up via email following our session. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and I'd like to encourage you to take the brief survey as you leave the session. Our slides and a recording of the webinar will be made available via email later today. Also, PDH certificates will be emailed within two days. Please join us again on, for our next webinar, which will be Thursday, June 28th at 2 p.m. for five tips on optimizing VSD vacuum pumps featuring Tim Dugan from Compression Engineering Corporation. This webinar is sponsored by Bush USA and Atlas Copco. Free registration is available on our website at blowervacuumbestpractices.com slash magazines slash webinars. Thank you. I hope everyone has a great rest of the afternoon.